Welcome to the latest episode of the Edgar Rice Burroughs mini podcast. These short podcasts are meant to supplement the full length episodes that I do with Scott Stewart and Jess Terrell, in which we generally talk about one of Edgar Rice Burroughs books in detail. My name is Tim DeForest. I'm the author of several books about what I call pre-digital pop culture, things like the pulp magazines that Burroughs was published in, old-time radio, classic comic books, old uh, B-movies, and so on. And I keep a blog about such things at comics, old-time radio, and other cool stuff. Right now, we're using the mini-podcast to do a chapter-by-chapter summary of the 1912 novel A Princess of Mars. Please note that we will be including spoilers both in, uh, regarding the chapter that we're discussing today and for the rest of the book and possibly for other books in the series. I would also recommend that you reread today's chapter before listening to the podcast, as I will be assuming that you are familiar with the events we are discussing. Today we're going to be looking at chapter 22. If, gee whiz, poor John Carter is put through an emotional roller coaster in this chapter, isn't he? First, he overhears Deja, Deja Thoris pledge herself to marry another man. Then he finds out that she did so only to save Helium from the Zodangans and went this route only because she thought John Carter is dead. Then he finds out that this promise to Sa- Sabthan is inviolable. Then he finds out that he can't kill Sabthan himself to get her out of this promise because that would disqualify him as a marriage prospect. All of this is part of the customs and culture of Barsoom. And Deja states that Barsoomians are ruled by custom. And perhaps they have to be. Even the savage green Martians have strict customs and codes of honor. In such a warlike culture, it can be argued that only rigid adherence to customs allows them to maintain a civilization at any level at all. Otherwise, the world would collapse into chaos and anarchy. Now, Deja Thoris explains all this and also admits to realizing that John Carter had offended her in an earlier chapter only because he didn't know Martian customs. So, other than the fact that she's now engaged to another man, John and Deja have finally admitted their feelings for one another and clearly understand each other. It's all very romantic, romantic, I suppose, although I have to object to one thing Deja says, quote, the promise uh, would have been yours long months ago, and you could have claimed me before all others. It might have meant the fall of Helium, but what I, I would have given my empire for my Tharkian chief, unquote. Now, for heaven's sakes, Deja, it's not all about you. You don't get to let your entire nation get destroyed because you have the hots for a random earth guy. Anyway, what makes this chapter so much fun is that the romantic stuff is well balanced by the action. The fight with the four guards outside Deja's room is fantastic, and John Carter continues to demonstrate his quick thinking under pressure, mapping out an escape route for that night and finding a great hiding spot. Now there's another coincidence here in that Dan Kosas just happens to get his updates about the situation right next to that hiding place, allowing John Carter to overhear a lot of vital information. But as with the events of in the last chapter, this doesn't feel contrived or wrong. The fast pacing and the fact that John Carter's actions make it feel as if he's again earned his good luck make it work. The job of a storyteller is to manipulate those of us reading the story, and John Carter does that expertly here. Now, there is like one other thing, or two other things actually. One is John Carter is assigned to the palace to guard uh, Thancosis against assassins. And Burroughs never really fully explains where professional assassins fit into uh, the code of honor that rule over all Martians. Um, I mean, you know, he doesn't really explain how assassination works. The implication is they work just the same way other assassins do on Earth, is that they would stab Thancosis in the back or in his sleep or poison, put poison in his cup or shoot him with a sniper rifle. Um, He needs bodyguards to prevent this from happening. But does that mean that assassins are outside that code of honor, that they are a despicable social order? Or as is sometimes implied in the Martian novels, are they considered a uh, legitimate, uh, uh, is assassin, uh, being an assassin considered a legitimate uh, profession on Mars? And if so, once again, how does that fit into the code of honor that obligates you to defend yourself only with the sort of weapon you're attacked with? 
it seems to frown on sneak attacks and uh, uh, knives in the dark. Um, it's just something that never is fully explained to us. I don't consider it a flaw in Burroughs' world building. It's just some information we're never quite given. And, but it would be interesting to see the total Martian code of honor, including how it applies to assassination, spelled out somewhere. And finally, the last thing is I like the idea of the royal psychologist who performs what I want to term forensic telepathy on the dead guards, reading their memories just before they died. That is just plain cool. That's it for now. Once again, my name is Tim DeForest. Please visit my blog at Comics Old Time Radio and other cool stuff. You'll also be able to find links to my Amazon.com author page there. Thank you for listening. We'll be back with another uh, mini podcast soon. And keep an ear out also for our full-length episodes.